<laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Who says politicians are boring? <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Let us know when we're good to go, Natalie. I will let you know to hang tight for one more minute, please. Okay. We should be playing some 70s music. Are we supposed to bring intro music, Bob? What's that? Are we supposed to bring intro music? <laughs> well, I will next time. Okay, we are live on Zoom and Facebook. So we're good to go? Yes, you can take it away. Okay, Emily Rutherford, it's all in your court. Thanks, Bob and Natalie. Uh, I, first off, I'd, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, that we are located on Treaty 6 territory uh, and that we respect the histories, language, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. And I want to thank everybody tonight for taking the time to participate in what I know is going to be a really meaningful uh, discussion. This town hall is something that the mayors and I have been working on for some time now. Uh, and if there's interest from the residents going forward, uh, it's something that we can start hosting on a more regular basis. Uh, we started planning this evening uh, a while ago, and, and in order to meet public health guidelines, which at the time, uh, we didn't know where they were going to be, uh, we decided to host this virtually. Uh, but we are excited to look forward to uh, in-person opportunities uh, in the future. So uh, for, for myself, uh, we've hosted engagement sessions over the past few years. Uh, we've done our own individual roundtables. Uh, had town halls with ministers and, and other events to connect with all of you, uh, but we thought this would be more impactful, uh, get a, a bigger and, and broader picture of what's happening in the whole region uh, collectively. So I, I've been the MLA for the Duke Beaumont for two years now, and uh, this is halfway through my term, and, and over the course of this time, I've been able to develop really strong relationships and, and partnerships uh, with both mayors, uh, as well as their respective councils and administrations, as we work together to make life better in our communities. And it's so important that all the levels of government uh, you know, work together to achieve that. Uh, Beaumont and Leduc work in tandem on many initiatives uh, due to their proximity, like negotiating successful regional transit. And in my opinion, uh, every project or initiative that we can obtain provincially uh, for one or the other, as well as Leduc County, uh, will serve to benefit the entire region. Uh, during my introductory remarks tonight, I'm gonna to provide an update on some provincial initiatives, uh, our economic recovery, uh, local priorities that I've been working on for the Duke Beaumont. Uh, but we'll start off briefly uh, with, with COVID. Uh, you know, Canada Day celebrations are occurring later uh, this week. Uh, and in line with that, July 1st, uh, restrictions are lifting as well uh, so that we can go back to uh, you know, celebrating Canada Day uh, as, we, as we knew it in the past, uh, in, you know, 16 months ago. Uh, and, and be able to have uh, a lot more, uh, you know, barbecues and family time and, and, and getting together with friends and family. So we're really looking forward to it. It's been a long road to get here. 
Uh, and each time the government introduced restrictions, you know, it, it came with hardships for, for Albertans. Uh, and, and I knew that and I, I gave that feedback to the government uh, as to uh, what was going on in the local communities. Uh, but we're here today, just a few days away from uh, restrictions being lifted in stage three because Albertans, you know, they made sacrifices. We've all had to persevere in some way. Uh, and, and all of our efforts were to keep each other safe and prevent the spread of COVID-19. You know, vaccines have brought us uh, a way out of this, uh, and we've had the most successful vaccine rollout in Canada. And because of that, I know Alberta will be the first province to remove all the restrictions, uh, you know, safely in just a few days. And of course, uh, we're over that 70% threshold and second doses is rising quite quickly and watching it every day. You know, lots of people getting out there and, and getting their vaccinations. Uh, we're, we are all too uh, well aware, uh, you know, of the damage that COVID-19 has caused, uh, you know, to our economy, local businesses. Uh, but times were tough even before COVID for, for a lot of folks. Uh, you know, I remember going back door to door in 2019. The economy was the, the overarching issue uh, that people had. Um, but overall, the province has supported Albertans uh, with initiatives like the emergency isolation payment, the small uh, and medium uh, enterprise relaunch grant, uh, and more. And now we're starting to see a shift towards economic growth and recovery. Alberta is poised uh, to lead economic growth in Canada this year. And, and we've started to see declines in the unemployment rate, gains in job creation month over month, as well as increased strength of our oil and gas prices. Uh, which are you know, forecasted to be $75 or higher uh, throughout this year and into early next year. Uh, we've seen massive investments uh, made recently with uh, $1.3 billion from air products uh, to build a net zero hydrogen energy facility in Port Saskatchewan, millions in, in new uh, film productions across Alberta as a result of the Alberta tax credit and venture capital investment. Uh, continues to transform you know, the Calgary region, but also the province, uh, which is uh, about diversification as well. Ladue, uh, you're getting, of course, you know, Bob, you're probably going to bring this up as well, but that $25 million for the Pure Fiber Network uh, is, uh, you know, is a really a, a big nod to the success of Ladue and, and its growth. And, and I feel quite optimistic uh, about the economic uh, strategy for Alberta and growth in the coming years. Uh, I've always said that our government ran on the economy and creating jobs, and despite of COVID-19, we, we have to deliver on that for Albertans. You know, local priorities, um, you know, two of my largest uh, from the beginning was seeing uh, funding uh, committed for the 65th Avenue Interchange Project in Leduc and, and new schools. Uh, you know, both mayors are probably going to point out at some point, uh, we have very fast growing communities uh, and we need infrastructure to catch up to that. Uh, and together we made this happen. And I, and I, I say together because it, it takes a lot of, of people to make these projects work. Uh, they're not done in silos or by individuals. It, it takes people working together. Uh, we have 33 million announced for the 65th Avenue uh, interchange, previously uh, not funded provincially by uh, other governments. And I know Mayor Young uh, the, and the city have been tremendous advocates for this project uh, and, and are looking forward to the construction as much as anybody. You know, residents they were clear in the last election about schools. Uh, the new K-12 Francophone School in Beaumont uh, is going to be a great addition, as well as the new high school in Leduc. And, you know, $66 million for twinning of Highway 19, uh, another important uh, corridor uh, for economic activity in this region. And one of the gems, uh, the Agri Value Processing Incubator in Leduc is getting a $25 million expansion right now. Uh, again, uh, economics, uh, jobs, long-term jobs, construction jobs. Uh, both Duke and Beaumont have been able to invest uh, really millions of dollars in projects through the Municipal Stimulus Program, uh, 2.2 million for Beaumont, Beaumont to revitalize the Ken Nickel uh, Rec Center, 4.5 million for Leduc to fund three road construction projects, uh, which help alleviate commuter and commercial traffic. Uh, and I've also been able to advocate for a lot of local not-for-profits uh, profits to receive uh, additional funding uh, and and mental health supports uh, as well over the last 16 months and two years. You know, a lot has happened um, and we're at the midway point and there's some exciting things going forward. Uh, Mayor Young and I are working hard with EIA and other stakeholders on the Airport Vicinity Protection Act. Uh, and there's gonna be, it's gonna be a great benefit to the city of Leduc uh, and because that, that's gonna unlock a lot of development, uh, residential and commercial. Uh, and I think it's really gonna help, uh, help the city grow. Uh, and Mayor Stewart, uh, you're probably going to bring this up as well, but I get to go first, so I get to uh, yeah, I was say, 
So I, I've been advocating, you know, of course, along with the mayor uh, on for provincial funding uh, to support the, the Beaumont Innovation Park. And, and this is again, different levels of government working together uh, to, to get results. Uh, there, there is growth pressure. Um, there's gonna be a need for new infrastructure. Um, I, I've been working very well uh, with, with these lo with local stakeholders, municipal officials, uh, and, and we have uh, a lot that we can achieve uh, together. Uh, and I, I want you to know that, that we're, we're, we're really well focused on, on regional goals and, and our communities as well. So uh, I'm going to be turning it over to uh, Mayor Stewart, and I look forward to the question and answer and, and, uh, and having a really good discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Emily Rutherford, uh, Mayor Young. Appreciate it. Uh, as uh, Brad said, I really hope this is the first of uh, many opportunities for our communities to engage with uh, one another like this. Uh, it's uh, always good. Uh, if you had told me four years ago that three of us would be leading our, our communities through a worldwide global pandemic, I'd have laughed. Um, but yet here we are and we've been living in interesting times. Um, but we can look to history. Um, just over 100 years ago, the Spanish flu swept across most of the globe, including Canada. And like the Spanish flu, the financial, social, and human costs of the COVID-19 pandemic, they're gonna have some lasting effects. But humans are resilient and they're tough. In time, people overcame the flu and big leaps in technology and medicine propelled society forward. Some examples, some telephone companies built up their infrastructure because human operated phone systems had been overwhelmed. We gained a better understanding of disease and government funded healthcare emerged. And today we're already starting to see what life after COVID can look like. Thanks to innovations in vaccine science. We can expect to see further changes to economies, society, and workforces. For example, many businesses have learned how employees can be productive even when working from home. And no one can say for sure what post-COVID economies will look like, but we can make sure that we're ready to adapt to changes and position our community for success as we emerge from the pandemic. During the last four years, Beaumont Council has been very hard at work on an agenda of change. We started untangling the red tape that stifled innovation and entrepreneurs. Our land use bylaw, it was once a really difficult maze with 37 distinct zones. Now we have seven. And then we made the bylaw into a living, breathing document so that it is reviewed and amended regularly to remove barriers to business and development that no longer make sense. And we also approved a streamlined plan and some design guidelines for Centreville that provide flexibility while still honoring Beaumont's French heritage. And Beaumont is also embracing innovation and emerging technology. The ELA driverless shuttle in 2019 was an example of that. We decided to boldly go where no regulation had gone before and put a self-driving vehicle on a public road for the first time in Western Canada. And we really do appreciate the cooperation from the provincial government to help us make that happen. We're also even challenging old approaches on really small scales. Our 3D crosswalk is an example of trying something new, learning from it, and then adapting. I really like to think of Beaumont as a sandbox where we're offering a place where if you can dream it, you can come to us and let's see if we can help make it happen. If you're working on a great idea, you want to test for scalability. Beaumont is small enough where we can be nimble, yet large enough to be relevant. Our Collaboration and Business Innovation Center, or COBIC, is another example of how we're filling the needs in the business community. COBIC opened last year as a solution for entrepreneurs who want a physical office where they can collaborate with like-minded people and scale up their business before they're ready for their own location. And earlier this year, as was mentioned, council established the Beaumont Innovation Park, a 160 acre site located on Highway 625. This park will become a place for businesses and investors to pursue innovations in fields like artificial intelligence, autonomous technology, virtual reality, data management, and many other possibilities that we can't even dream of right now. And heads are turning as a result of these actions. Our growing reputation is beginning to pay off with huge benefits for our residents and community just on the horizon. Last year, we announced that we're in talks with a consortium of leading global technology firms to install a 10, gigab 10 gigabit per second broadband network. Sorry, stumbled there a little bit. If all goes as planned, every home and business would have access to the fastest technology available commercially in the world, which is about 100 times faster than the current average download speed in Canada. And if anything else, if nothing else, the pandemic highlighted the need for fast, reliable internet service. And we're gonna work really hard to bring the best right here to Beaumont. 
And it can be an enabler that unleashes the innovative potential that we've seen as Beaumont businesses pivoted their service model during the last several months. And our city continues to work with our business community through the challenges of the pandemic. Our Open and Beaumont Shop Local campaign last summer was done in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce, leveraging our mutual strengths for a greater benefit. And just yesterday, our membership in the Discover Leduc Region Tourism Partnership went live. We joined Leduc, Devon, and others along with the Chambers of Commerce in Leduc and Beaumont to promote our communities as destinations for regional tourism. And Beaumont has a lot to offer, from a four-star championship-style Lynx golf course to dozens of kilometers of paved trails with breathtaking views in an urban nature setting. And our businesses provide a selection that includes unique cuisine that reflects our French heritage to a hip brew pub and a range of home gift, clothing and artisanal craft boutiques. And of course, while Beaumont is becoming a great place to shop, play, dine and do business, it still has to be a great place to live. And so following the map set by our new master plan, we're making significant investments in recreation and culture. In addition to the newly modernized and expanded Beaumont Sport and Recreation Center, we built two new outdoor rinks last year, thanks to stimulus funding from the Alberta government. We're also giving the Ken Nickel Regional Recreation Center a new lease on life, as Emily Rutherford mentioned. And this summer, we're building a multi-use field in Four Seasons Park, along with a new ball diamond complex in a dog park in West Beaumont. And we're not gonna forget about the arts. We've also established a steering committee to explore the potential for a performing arts center and are working with our library to plan an expansion of their building as well. And these investments are being made with a keen eye on fiscal responsibility. Working with our city administration, our council was able to deliver a budget for this year that found nearly a half a million dollars in savings and efficiencies. It also makes targeted investments to maintain and enhance services and holds the line on taxes with no increase in 2021. And we're also encouraging a culture in our city administration and in the community that embraces diversity as a benefit. The lived experience of people from different backgrounds makes us stronger and more innovative with new ideas and perspectives. So as we emerge from the pandemic, we have a really strong wind at our back. Beaumont's rapid growth continues. Construction permits issued in the first four months of this year total nearly $30 million, and they're on a pace to beat recent years. In the last few years, the non-residential tax base has grown by two percentage points. And that might seem small, but consider that in a community growing as fast as Beaumont, the business property base had to grow four times faster than the residential base for that to happen. So our work to attract investment and business growth is crucial to deal with the impacts of that growing population. For the second year in a row, Beaumont ranked as Alberta's safest community. But we'll need more police officers in the next few years to stay that way as the city grows. And a larger city also puts pressure on our fire services. We've approved strategies to enhance fire response times for the next several years, but we'll need to make a significant investment in our fire service in the future. Our work to diversify the tax base with more business activity, as well as our efforts to become more cost-effective delivering city services will also help us address those pressures. But we're also building strong partnerships with neighbors like the city of Leduc. We recently signed a mutual aid agreement that enhances the fire protection for residents and businesses in both cities. We've agreed to a model for economic development that encourages collaboration and the sharing of resources and benefits to attract business investment. And we'll also explore how we can reduce barriers and streamline processes between our communities for business. The region's municipalities also just rallied together to support the Edmonton International Airport's efforts to retain and attract flights as we come out of the pandemic. The airport is a cornerstone of our regional economy. It employs dozens of residents from Beaumont and is a conduit of goods for many businesses. The last 16 months have been challenging and there's no overstating that. But the pandemic is coming to an end, and as we emerge, Beaumont is ready for a post-COVID society and economy. Council's strategic plan gives us a roadmap that not only builds innovation, but has resiliency and adaptability baked into it. So that when we look back 100 years from now, or even 10 years, we will see this is the time that Beaumont took action to shape its future rather than letting change wash over us. It will be the time when we laid the groundwork for a Beaumont that is not only the safest community in Alberta and a great place to live, it also became a great place to start or grow a company, where it is not just a great place to raise a family, but it is a place where your children could find good paying, skilled jobs so they could stay and raise a family of their own. It was a time when Beaumont chose to embrace the challenges it faced, make the hard decisions and do the difficult work so that our community not only survived the pandemic, but we thrived. And we will continue to do that with partnerships with Emily Rutherford in the province of Alberta and Mary Young in the city of Leduc, and we'll get through this together. 
And like Emily Rutherford, th thank you for letting me uh, have a couple of opening remarks and I look, uh, look forward to the Q&A and uh, I'm pretty sure Mary Young being the last panel speaker is up next. So I'll have to tell you, bud. Thanks, John. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here tonight along MLA Rutherford and Mayor Stewart to connect with the residents of Leduc and Beaumont and to share about some of the exciting things that are happening in our region. I'd like to start this evening by discussing this year's Canada Day event. First and foremost, on behalf of the City of Leduc, I want to express our sincere sadness and sympathy for Indigenous communities across the country as we mourn the tragic news of the unmarked grave sites of children from former residential school sites in British Columbia and Saskatchewan. I believe that Canada Day represents an opportunity for all of us to reflect on our history and to identify our issues where we need to make change. While we'll be proceeding with the Canada Day activities currently planned with our neighboring municipalities, I encourage everyone to join us in a moment of silence at 2.15 p.m. to pay respect to the young lives lost including those yet to be recovered, as well as the survivors of, of the residential school system. Along with the start of July comes the promise wide reopening under stage three of the open for summer plan. As I'm sure we all know, the provincial mask mandate will be lifted on Thursday, except in specific settings like continuing care and acute care centers, public transit, taxis and ride sharing, and inside fire halls and ambulances. Here in Leduc, my council colleagues and myself, we suspended our mask bylaw indefinitely last March, which means that this Thursday, wearing a mask in Leduc will no longer be required in most circumstances. Please note, however, that masking, physically distancing, and group size limits will continue to be practiced by staff and visitors at both of our firehouses in accordance with direction from Alberta Health Services as Leduc Fire Services is an integrated service with Alberta Health Services. Of course, business owners may also choose to require their patrons to continue masking. This will be done at their own discretion and is, responsibly, is their responsibility to enforce. Likewise, some residents may choose to continue masking in, in spite of provincial mandate being lifted. And I ask everyone in our community to remember that masking is now a personal choice and to be kind and considerate and supportive of one another. At the LRC, staff are excited to welcome back our patrons to the facility. Starting on Thursday, July 1st, pre-booking through the live Leduc app will no longer be required for that. It will no longer be required in the Remax Fitness Center, the indoor track, the Alexander Outdoor Pool and Lane and Public Swim, the Aquatic Center Lane and Public Swim. And please note, however, that there are activity-based block times throughout the day so refer to the schedule on page 23 of the city guide for details. You can continue to reserve your spot for group fitness classes, AquaFit drop-in classes, and leisure drop-in opportunities through the Leduc Live app. Also beginning Thursday, we will be able to further accommodate community rentals and audience members at the McLab Center for Performing Arts. And city council meetings will reopen in person for public participation although virtual participation will still remain an option. Results from our 2021 Citizen Satisfaction Survey were released yesterday, and we're happy to share that 95% of the residents have indicated they are pleased with Leduc services and the quality of life in our community. One of the most significant factors contributing to the high quality of life in our community, according to residents, are Leduc's parks and trail system. Indeed, as highlighted in our Go Leduc campaign over the last several months, our community does include numerous beautiful trails, parks, and facilities and outdoor spaces for residents and visitors to get outside and enjoy, especially during this uh, heat wave that we're experiencing right now. So we're glad to hear that so many people enjoy them. This, of course, includes the Leduc Spray Park, which we were excited to announce yesterday was reopened ahead of schedule. Um, unfortunately, we didn't uh, know that there was going to be a heat wave scheduled for this time of the, uh, of the month or this time of the year. And so uh, we had scheduled to get some um, much needed maintenance on it. And uh, lucky for us, they were able to um, get things done ahead of schedule and it opened up uh, yesterday. So we're really happy on my way to uh, my office tonight. I was looking at all the kids out there enjoying a little envious that they get to sit under the uh, spray park while I'm sitting here in my office 
uh, under the 28 degrees uh, Celsius uh, temperature. So we know that this being the hottest week of the summer so far, that the spray park is going to see lots of visitors in the coming days. So we're really thrilled to have it open and it's perfect timing. In addition to parks and outdoor recreation facilities, there are a number of summer events planned in our community in the coming weeks, including the third Thursday summer event series hosted by our Downtown Business Association, which will take place on July 15th, August 19th, and September 16th. The Leduc Farmers Market is also back for the 2021 season, running Thursdays and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. in the LRC parking lot. Another area of service in our community that received high ratings in the Citizen Satisfaction Survey is our fire response. Leduc Fire Services has consistently ranked among the top rated services in our city according to the Biannual Citizen Survey. And as our city and region grow, we continue to seek opportunities for partnerships that will further enhance the safety of our residents and businesses. And so for this reason, we're very pleased uh, that we entered into a mutual aid agreement with uh, our neighbors in the city of Beaumont, as John mentioned previously, which will allow each city to request fire assistance from each other in times of need. Local and regional partnerships, such as this collaboration with the Beaumont Fire Services, are a key component of our community's ongoing growth, long term prosperity, and also our economic recovery following the COVID 19 pa pandemic. Another relationship that has grown over the last 15 minutes, uh, 15 months is between us, the Downtown Business Association, and the Leduc, Nisku, and Wetaskiwin Regional Chamber of Commerce. We have worked very closely on a number of strategies through the City's Economic Support and Recovery Task Force, and we look forward to continuing this collaboration on projects such as the Discover Leduc Region, which aims to grow our local tourism business, as well as a recently announced Startup Leduc Region initiative which will support local entrepreneurs to foster and grow their homegrown business ideas. We're also pleased to provide collaborative support for local businesses through the Get Digital program, which pairs local small business owners with students from the University of Alberta School of Retailing to conduct an audit of the business e-commerce and online presence. Through this program, local businesses will receive up to 12 hours of service to support their digital expansion. In the longer term, two key growth projects that we continue to ad advocate for our funding for the 65th Avenue interchange and changes to the airport vicinity protection area regulations. So to date, uh, as Brad mentioned earlier, the government of Alberta has committed uh, $33 million. Um, the city of Leduc is gonna be putting in $12.5 million. And we are looking uh, for the federal government to uh, put in uh, approximately $49 million. And this uh, ask has gone from the provincial government to the federal government. And we've been working hard lately to try and uh, get support. Uh, we're, we're feeling that in the next little while, we should get some announcement from the federal government. We're very confident that we're very close with that. We've reached out to many ministries and right to the uh, PMO's office. And so uh, we're hoping that our, all our efforts are gonna come to fruition here pretty quick. 65th Avenue is going to unlock uh, lands on the airport and our North Leduc Business Park. It will attract investment. It will build and strengthen transportation connections and it will create jobs. And so we're very, very, um, well, we're really positive that uh, in the next little while, we're gonna get a great uh, announcement from the federal government. Earlier this year, we began sharing information with our local businesses and residents about the airport vicinity protection area regulations. And it's a very important topic for the community to understand. These regulations impact where we can and can't build, which in turn affects how the city can develop and grow. The city of Leduc is a proud participant in many regional initiatives, and the regulations are hindering our ability to meet some of the mandates that are coming out of uh, those groups, such as density targets established by the Edmonton Metro Region Board. We are committed to and encourage growth that will benefit the city and the region and support the 24 hour operations at Edmonton Air Airport. Without a doubt, um, EIA plays an important role in our collective success in the whole region. And we believe that there is a shared path forward and a win-win solution for all that are involved. 
Projects such as the 65th Avenue Interchange and AVPA Education and Advocacy play a key role in positioning our community for growth and creating opportunities for the future. Similarly, expansion on the Leduc Golf Club grounds, including the new stunning uh, clubhouse, will greatly increase our ability to attract and host larger tournaments and events in our city. We already seeing evidence of this with the Leduc Golf Club confirmed to host the Canadian Junior Girls Championship coming up later this month from July 19th to 23rd. Beyond that, we've heard from organizations, uh, hockey, slow pitch, skating, golf, and curling tournaments who expressed their interest in potentially hosting their events in our community. The city of Leduc is known nationwide for our ability to host sporting events of all sizes and helping our visitors to stand out in Leduc. As our sports tourism program continues to grow, so does our community's profile on the national and international stage. For this reason, investing in sports tourism really is an investment in the viability of our local economy. As hosting these events brings people and money into our community through hotel bookings, restaurant and retail sales, and much more. As the province, the country, and the rest of the world gradually reopen, we are very excited for the return of sporting events to our city. Another recent project that we are hopeful will serve to attract visitors to our community, as well as providing environmental benefits, is the construction of a solar carport and two electric vehicle charging stations. They will be downtown at the corner of 49th Street and 49th Avenue. Each charging station will be able to charge two vehicles at a time, with a solar carport that is expected to reduce Leduc's carbon dioxide emissions by approx approximately 15 tons annually. There are currently no level three supercharging stations between Edmonton and Red Deer, so we anticipate that this installation could draw visitors to our downtown core and support local businesses while they charge their vehicles. Installation costs will be shared between municipal budget and grant funding, and pending approval of the grant, we expect installation to take place by October of this year. Also slated for completion toward the end of this year are four new Habitat for Humanity homes that are currently under construction. We are very pleased to partner with Habitat for Humanity, Qualico, and Pay Center Homes on this project in the Meadowview community. And we look forward to welcoming four new families in need of affordable housing into the community by the end of the year. Recruitment of eligible families is currently underway, so interest, interested families can visit hfh.org.org for more details and begin to uh, get into the application process. And as Emily Rutherford mentioned, uh, we were very happy to announce the TELUS Pure Fiber project. Um, it, it, he had the dollars wrong. They actually are gonna be investing $37 million in our community because they've also expanded it to uh, all our residential uh, neighborhoods in Leduc as well. And that's one thing, again, during the pandemic, we have been really, enforced on how important uh, broadband and internet access is. The other thing that uh, Emily Rutherford mentioned about is our new high school in Crystal Creek. And we're hoping that construction will start fairly soon and it should be open uh, by 2024. So these are just a few of the updates of what's happening in our city over the next few months. With vaccination rates continuing to climb and the province on the verge of reopening after a year of restrictions, there is great reason today to be hopeful for the future of our province and our communities. So I'm glad that we're here this evening with MLA Rutherford and Mayor Stewart to connect with you all. And I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. So without further ado, let's get started with the Q&A. Natalie, have you got some questions for us? I do have questions, <laughs> um, several actually. Uh, so we'll start off with a question that was submitted ahead of time through our virtual question box. Um, and it says, um, what action are you taking in the region to address Indigenous peoples along with the negative and deadly impacts of the residential school system uh, last school closed in the 90s? The city of Edmonton is taking down their Grandin signs. Imagine being Indigenous and knowing that your city was named after a proponent of genocide who knowingly allowed for murder, abuse, and brainwashing of your family members. Uh, Father Leduc has blood on his hands, so will we if we don't address the intergenerational trauma, addiction, and grief of Indigenous peoples in the Leduc Beaumont area. Beaumont is not off the hook either. Signage in the colonial neighborhood 
um, centering the celebration and telling of their history around the Catholic St. Vital Church, uh, not the Papistice peoples who were pushed off their lands. What, a, what about the province? All of our children need to be educated with the truth. The new curriculum is a joke and once again, biased Christian religion. Why do we give churches with a history of abuse and murder um, a tax break? Why do we use public funds for their schools? You closed the safe consumption site in Edmonton. Who do you think was using it? Um, that's right, residential school survivors. How are you going to fund the healing and future prosperity of Indigenous peoples? It is not just an Indian Act or federal issue. What are we, and specifically you as elected officials, going to do about it? Okay, so we're starting off with a, a very tough and interesting uh, question. Um, I know that, uh, Leduc, that we are definitely taking a look at our strategies moving forward. Um, you know, we, we don't have a large Indigenous population in Leduc, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't take a look at uh, a strategy and developing a strategy moving forward. Um, one of the things that I, I think that uh, we want to make sure is that uh, <clears throat> when we do move forward with the strategy, that uh, it, um, it's well thought out and it takes all the uh, different um, uh, all the different uh, t uh, things into a, a account that we can. It's it, you know it's a it's a tough right now because we, we haven't had a chance really to sit down and 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 develop our strategy. But I know that um, with everything that's happened, that this is uh, something that will move to the top of the list of things that we need to get done. Um, Emily Rutherford, did you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> there, there's a number of things to touch on there. Um, so if I miss anything, Natalie, uh, just just let me know. Uh, on the supervised consumption sites, uh, some of them are, are being moved. There, there is a Supreme Court decision that doesn't let them to allow them just to be outright closed. Uh, so as far as I understand from the strategy from the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, uh, it is that these sites uh, will be more dispersed uh, and it'll be likely based on uh, calls for service or, or other indicators that are happening uh, throughout the community. Uh, I believe in Edmonton, for example, um, the supervised consumption sites uh, were, were concentrated into one area. Uh, and, and to be able to have people uh, use those sites, uh, they, they can be in different areas and more spread out. Um, but the, the, the provincial government's also looking at a, a continuum of care uh, and, and understanding that consumption sites are a part of that. Uh, and, and so is uh, treatment in, in addiction beds. The, the fees have been removed on those. Uh, so that they're more accessible to people as well uh, and, and so that there there is wraparound services uh, there's a new naloxone <clears throat> uh, pilot project in edmonton uh, that has started uh, as well as a, an app called doors uh, which uh, provides a, a service uh, really a, a timer that has to be hit routinely uh, and if not uh, the assumption is that somebody is overdosing and, and medical services are are sent uh, to that person's residence uh, <clears throat> These, these kinds of steps, I, I hope, are, are going to help. Uh, and, and to be uh, to be quite uh, quite frank, like in, in my in my background prior to this, um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of the damage that uh, drug drug use, addiction, mental health issues can cause. Um, you know, for the for the Truth and Reconciliation Report, you know, one of the one of the um, uh, the, the calls to action that stood out to me, I think, was number thirty one, which which had a line about dealing with the root cause uh, of, a, of a problem. And, and I, I, I've always, uh, you know, for, for the last several years uh, prior to this, you know, looked at our justice system and said, is it dealing with root causes of problems? And if not, then we're, we're setting people up for repetitive, uh, repetitive behavior as, as well. So uh, I think some of those things need to be uh, addressed. Um, and, and I think they can be. There's the mental health court now, the drug court. Uh, Calgary has an indigenous uh, court. Uh, and recognizing cultural differences and sensitivities as well. Uh, the provincial government has the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, uh, which provides major revenue streams uh, to Indigenous communities, uh, which wouldn't have had access to these kinds of, uh, of loans and opportunities before uh, for natural resource development. Uh, the Moose Lake uh, Access uh, Management Fund, uh, which is a balance of environmental concerns and treaty rights, uh, and, and again, uh, resource development. Uh, there's also the Alberta Joint Working Group on Murdered and Missing in, uh, Indigenous Women and Girls. 
Uh, and recently, uh, $8 million announced uh, by the provincial government to uh, fund research to look for undocumented burial sites uh, and, and deaths of Indigenous children. Uh, it is a dark history, a dark part of our history here in Canada. Uh, and we have to put the funds uh, forward and the effort forward to, to find them uh, to, and to have First Nations lead that effort. Uh, and, and that's part of what this, this grant will do is, it, it, for as far as I understand, it's uh, fairly open in its uses uh, as well, which is important. Uh, and then the, the fees have also been waived uh, for, for uh, residential school survivors to reclaim their uh, traditional Indigenous names as well. Um, on, on the curriculum, uh, Indigenous history starts in social studies grade one, residential schools is introduced in grade five. Uh, there is a commitment to, to, to keep uh, First Nations Métis Inuit content in that curriculum. Uh, and students will learn Indigenous histories and contributions and perspectives across all subjects and grades. Uh, and, and so this is the first time that students are going to learn factual information with Indigenous peoples in proper sequence. So this includes age-appropriate Indigenous you know, content, uh, geographic places, treaties, agreements, residential schools, that legacy that, that has happened as well. Um, a, you know, part of part of that learning is Grand Chief uh, Little Child uh, as well, uh, you know, providing you know, uh, accounts as a residential school survivor uh, as well. So it, it is included in that curriculum. Now, in, in terms of, I don't know if the question was around Christian uh, education, but or or uh, creation stories, it, it does include First Nation creation stories as well uh, to to give you know kids an understanding uh, of different perspectives. Perspectives uh, and to move students through a, a, a progressive set of, of historical steps and things that have happened to build on their education. So uh, I don't know, Mayor Stewart, if you want to add something to that. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to take it down to just focus on my own community for a second. Uh, those, those are some pretty broad initiatives going on in the province. Um, but in Beaumont, our council, we're on a, we're on a, we're, we're very aware of uh, the diversity and inclusion of Indigenous peoples into our city. Uh, and so we started on, on, on taking some steps. And so we started with our council and our senior administration receiving diversity and inclusion training, which is a key step. Um, and we've started building relationships with our Indigenous peoples over the last two years. We recognized May Tea Week and National Indigenous Peoples Days. We hosted a smudging ceremony for opening our new recreation center. And the May Tea Nation and Treaty Six Flags are now permanently on display uh, in our council chambers. Yeah. And just... Uh, to, to maintain the colonial sensitivities, we recently decided to cancel a project for an official coat of arms uh, when we realized that it can be seen as a symbol of colonialism and it wasn't perhaps uh, going to be uh, received very well by the Indigenous community. And so we know that there's still more work, but we, but we believe that uh, in Beaumont that it's going, that it is very important um, that we start by building a strong relationship with uh, the Métis and the, and the, and the, and the indigenous populations in, in and around the Edmonton area. Um, and so that we work in collaboration with them rather than us as, us as individual politicians and, and city councils and um, making unilateral changes that may or may not be accepted. Uh, and so that's where moment's at right now. It's we're, we're building those key relationships um, to move forward down that reconciliation path. Yeah. And, and I, I think to add in too, so this is one of the things that uh, we've been discussing with uh, mid-sized cities uh, as well. And those are all the cities in, in Alberta, except for Emerson and Calgary. And so one of the things that we're talking about is uh, how can we reach out and help uh, with uh, some of the um, Indigenous settlements uh, to help them with uh, um, water and sewer. And, and so um, we're going to be reaching out and taking a look to see if there are things that we can do to... because. Uh, we just don't think it's right that uh, there are communities in in Alberta that don't have proper and water uh, and sewer uh, facilities, and so I, I think that's one of the ways that we can uh, reach out uh, with our expertise and and uh, hopefully uh, make things better. It's it's just the beginning, though. Like you know, this is uh, this has been something new that's uh, been uh, just come up. And I think that, uh, you know, to be fair, we need a little bit of time. It's, I think it's more important that we get it right than we get it done quickly. And, uh, you know, I, I hope people will allow us. I think, uh, you know, City of Leduc, we, we have a, a very inclusive and a caring and safe community. And I'm hoping that uh, people will give us a chance um, to uh, formulate a strategy and, and, and put it out there, uh, you know, 
we think, again, it's more important that we get it right than we get it done fast. Next question. Yeah, uh, okay, so one, sorry, one second. Uh, another question that was sent in ahead of time. Uh, it's for you, Mayor Young, and they're asking, when will a pride crosswalk be painted in Lviv? That's a good question. Uh, I, I know that we have, uh, and we've been flying the pride flag. Um, I don't know if I can give you a date when there will be a pride uh, crosswalk. I've been looking and watching, uh, you know, with uh, a lot of the other communities and some of the uh, newscasts, and I absolutely think that that would be a great idea. Uh, we just have to find the uh, right place in Leduc, and uh, I'm looking for if there's a group out there that would love to uh, uh, head up this task, uh, give me a call, uh, send me an email, and would love to sit down and uh, talk about this. Next question, Natalie. Yeah, okay. So next question is uh, for Mayor Stewart. They say, Beaumont is growing fast. When will you add more police officers? Uh, in interesting question. Um, we actually just recently had a, uh, uh, a presentation from Sergeant Harp Dollywall, our, our uh, detachment commander, uh, about this very thing. And so he's laid out a map uh, forward to be able to add, um, more officers to uh, to us, um, and so we'll be looking at our budget. Our council will be deliberating those. Uh, uh, sorry, council will be deliberating uh, that discussion in the fall as to when when and how we're going to add those officers. Um, Beaumont is the safest community in Alberta. Two years running, so um, we, we know that the RCMP officers that we do have are doing great work, and uh, we like to we're going we're to keep them on. Keep them on and keep them going and, and support them as how we can but also being the fifth fastest growing community in canada we realize that you can't maintain the status quo forever so we'll be looking at that in the fall and so more information to come natalie i'll just jump in there um on on the provincial uh, side uh, the the province has requested more rcmp officers they did in 2019 uh, just to give you an idea they the first request was for 76 uh and, and 70 new officers have arrived. Uh, I imagine with the, with the pandemic, things have slowed down a little bit, but uh, that included, uh, I think, 46 uh, civilian staff as well um, to help bolster the numbers in the province, which is important. And then on, on July 1st, the, the, the rapid uh, force initiative uh, for uh, highway sheriffs, they'll be, they'll be able to enforce uh, additional uh, uh, acts in, in criminal code uh, sections uh, out on the highways, which will help RCMP officers as well and, and in their uh, response times, which is important. And the other thing I think I would add to this too, because uh, there's, I think most municipalities in Alberta that um, there's always a lag between uh, the time that you actually put uh, in for a new officer in your budget and before you actually get one from, uh, from the depot. And I think uh, this is a, one of those areas where COVID has really uh, impacted that because I know that their training uh, facilities um, uh, were basically shut down uh, during COVID. And so I know in talking with the uh, district uh, um, RCMP that, you know, this is one of the concerns that they have right now. And so they're looking at ways that they can speed up delivery of uh, new officers uh, to our region. So this is this has always been sort of a challenge is that, um, you know, when you do put a new officer in the budget, there's always a, a little bit of a lag time before they um, actually get to your community. And I, but I think the RCMP are uh, moving to try and correct that. Next question, Natalie. Yeah, so a uh, question that came in through Facebook. Um, they're asking, uh, why did the Deer Valley Dog Park get canceled before the pilot project even began? That's for you, Mayor Young. Oh, another good question. So what happened, and I think that whenever uh, we neglect or we don't do um, uh, a public consultation before we uh, get involved with some of these projects, that we end up with a, a problem. And I think that um, even though, um, you know, like we're, we're, we're very focused on trying to get a new dog park in the West End, um, that this area, um, we had a lot of uh, uh, reaction from people that live right around the proposed dog park 
And so uh, what we're going to do is we actually have a new uh, subdivision coming on uh, stream for the new high school, close to the new high school. And what happens, is we, and we found the same thing with multiways and with other uh, amenities like that. If uh, we put the multiways in after uh, people have already bought their lots and have houses in there, um, it, it tends to be a problem because um, when people are, are purchasing their property, there's no multiway there. And all of a sudden you put a multiway in there. Some people don't mind it, some people do. So this is sort of the same thing with the dog park. So what we're gonna do is we have a new subdivision uh, that'll be opening up fairly soon. And what we'll be able to do is uh, plan and put a dog park in there where it uh, doesn't uh, interfere with any residential. Um, it'll be fenced, controlled area. And uh, you know, I know it, it's gonna take a little bit longer, but we, again, rather get it right than uh, get it done quickly. Thanks, Natalie. Next question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so next one is for MLA Rutherford and they're asking, uh, is there any communication between the federal and provincial level regarding getting international flights back to the EIA? Yeah, so I understand that this has come up with, uh, with EIA uh, going to various municipalities and, and, and looking for support for, for international flights and attracting them. Uh, the last stat I saw, I think it's still 85% down uh, from last year. Uh, they're international visitors. There was something around 8,000 uh, last month. Uh, I'm rounding now. I don't have it right in front of me. Um, and now, it, it, you know, for, for EIA, like uh, I have done everything I can to really advocate uh, you know, for them, uh, which includes the, the, the interchange project. Uh, I, I know that there is some help that has come from the federal government in different ways uh, and from the provincial government. If there's a specific ask uh, around support uh, for for international flights, uh, happy to take that forward. Uh, they would it would likely be between the uh, uh, Minister McIver and Transportation on that, uh, and to and to see where that's at uh, as well. But we are also going to need a more cohesive strategy out of the federal government on the rules surrounding international flights. Uh, there's going to need to be you know consistency. Uh, there's going to there's going to need to be you know very clear information as to what's expected of people, uh, and, and then once that's laid out, then I think they're going to see more travelers uh, you know, coming coming to Canada. They originally there was pilot projects and at the Calgary airport is being expanded to Edmonton on on rapid tests and, and helping people get moving quicker, uh, and I, I think the the, the province has called for that to come back, and and that'll be a big step uh, in the right direction, and I think that's going to help uh, get more people who want to visit here. And, you know, frankly, I just don't think you can spend the majority of your, your vacation sitting in a, in a hotel waiting to, uh, waiting to leave, uh, especially when, when some of those programs have, uh, have already shown just through news stories that there, there's holes in them already, people crossing the border by vehicle instead of by plane and, uh, and different things like that. So <clears throat> um, if there's a specific ask, happy to go forward uh, to the minister and get some information. I know there's been previous help, but uh, I, I think a, a cohesive strategy from the feds would, would go a long way here. I, I, and I would jump into this as well. So um, all of municipalities around Edmonton, so Edmonton and there's uh, three towns, five cities and four uh, counties. Um, you know, we formed the Edmonton Metro Region Board. And I think this is an opportunity, um, you know, because we basically, um, we formed the board so that we can start operating as one region and start to lobbying and advocate for one region. And I think this is an opportunity here where I think Edmonton Metro Region Board that we have to do more. And I, I think um, working with EIA and working with uh, their board as well, I think that uh, we need, you know, that we can work together and start lobbying and advocating uh, to the federal government to make sure uh, that uh, EIA isn't uh, left out of the international flights. Uh, you know, we patterned EMRB after the Metro Denver Economic Development uh, Region. And one of the, the most important things is an airport in an economic development region. And so uh, we have to do everything we can to support the airport. And uh, like I say, I think that uh, EMRB um, working with um, the provincial government, I think that we can play a role to uh, help make sure that uh, EIA isn't left out when it comes to uh, international flights. Next question, Natalie. Yeah, so uh, next one is directed towards both Mayor Young and Mayor Stewart. Um, they're saying- we'll let John take the first crack at it. <laughs> Sounds fair. 
Um, they say both towns instituted COVID policy on businesses and residents based on government recommendations. What evidence were you presented as you made your decisions? And what have you done to evaluate what measures were effective and which were not? And how will you use this information to formulate policy for future public health concerns? Appreciate that. It's a, it, that's actually a really interesting question um, because Beaumont is, is a small city. We don't have our own public health departments. Um, so a couple of things we need to get clear right off the hop is that we are very reliant on the, on the provincial government for the guidance on this. Um, and we didn't put COVID policies in place through, through government recommendations. Those are public health orders. Um, those, we, were, uh, we were bound by, bound by those orders to implement uh, the policies that we did. Uh, and so we really do rely on, on the provincial government and Alberta Health Services and the CM, uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health Office um, to evaluate those and lead us and guide us through those. Uh, and so that was Beaumont's stance throughout it all is uh, we were gonna follow the province and remain in lockstep with them um, because those were the experts, th they had the advice. And so that's what we followed. We relied on them. Good answer, Mayor Stewart. And I, like the city of Duke is the same way. Like the, uh, we took our lead from Dr. Hinshaw and from the Alberta government and Alberta Health Services. And so um, we were meeting like the, you know, like. I wish there would have been an easy answer for this. I wish there would have been a pandemic playbook uh, before we got into this. Um, I can tell you right now that our council, um, nobody knew when we uh, put our names forward at the last uh, election that we we're going to have to deal with a uh, international pandemic. And uh, so um, I think that, yes, it's very easy to, in hindsight to sit back and say, oh, there's things that we should have done. But um, when you're doing it in real time, it's not as easy. And so, you know, we, we basically, we depend on the guidance from, um, you know, Alberta Health Services and Dr. Henshaw and uh, the Alberta government. And, uh, you know, and the premier has said that, you know, there are things that if he had to do it over again, he would do them differently. But that's the, uh, that's the benefit of hindsight. And so, you know, I think that when you take a look, um, Alberta is uh, uh, going to be one of the first provinces that is going to be lifting all restrictions, uh, except for a few minor ones. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, yes, there are probably some things we could have done a little bit different. But uh, all in all, um, I'm really happy where we are, and I'll be even happier on July 1st, and uh, we'll be open for summer. Next question, Natalie. So next one came in for MLA Rutherford. They're asking, when are we able to travel outside of the province again? Um, well, leaving the province is really up to uh, other provinces. So if you're gonna be uh, going to any region, um, whether you're gonna be traveling to the States or another province, what all I would suggest on that is to look to uh, the area that you're going uh, for, uh, uh, for what their uh, public health orders are or restrictions are, just so you're aware ahead of time. Um, but uh, you know, in two days, all of our restrictions uh, are, are lifted uh, with a few minor ones uh, that won't be affecting travel. Uh, but really your ability to, to drive out of Alberta or fly out of Alberta is, is really based on the destination that you're going to. Uh, and so I, I would just look ahead of time as to where you're going and, and plan on, on what their uh, protocols are. And if you take a look at um, uh, British Columbia, for example, um, they they recommend uh, or they would like to, uh, you know, uh, they're they're it's just a recommendation. It's not an actual order. And so uh, when you talk to uh, some of the communities that are especially the ones that are along the Alberta BC uh, border, um, they depend on Albertans uh, coming in, especially now when we're when we're heading into tourism season. And so. Uh, you know, even though um, there's recommendations not to travel into BC, um, there are going to be, because again, there's a lot of Albertans that own property in BC. So you will see them travel back and forth. And uh, trust me, the uh, merchants there are glad to see Albertans there um, with their credit cards and their wallets. Next question, Natalie. Yeah, um, we have another one for Emily Rutherford. Um, they're saying, you have a role in government liaising with the military. Have you supported anything locally for the Leduc Legion, which has really struggled throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? 
there my first mute issue. Um, yes, uh, I, I have, um, you know, in, in working with the, the legions, it's a great group of people uh, and, and happy to support them. Um, obviously, they, they were affected as much as anybody, uh, given the business that they're mainly in. So, I mean, with the support of Premier Kenny, uh, I, I reached out to Minister McCauley Federally, who's the Veterans Affairs Minister. We had a you know, really good conversation uh, and uh, they were developing a program to support legions. And I believe the Leduc Re uh, Legion uh, re received uh, you know, a portion of that funds, uh, around eighteen or nineteen thousand, uh, to to help them. Uh, don't hold me to that number. Uh, and it's just been going off memory on that one uh, to to assist them uh, as well. Um, and and I, I, I obviously lifting you know restrictions in a couple of days is going to go a long way for them. Uh, and I encourage everybody to get out there for a beer. Uh, you know, it's a great group of people, and uh, there's there's usually a couple. Well, uh, fun draws happening uh, as well. So I, I look forward to, to getting out there um, and, and uh, you know, really connecting with that community uh, again, because, uh, you know, the role as military liaison, I actually hope to, you know, get out to a, a number of legions and, and meet uh, you know, various presidents and, and stakeholders there and, and really get their feedback on, on what's working, what's not working um, and, <clears throat> and taking that and helping inform, uh, you know, the work that I'm, that I'm doing. Next question. Yeah, uh, one came in for Mayor Stewart. Uh, they say, if possible, I would like to suggest Beaumont to keep records of the landlords who own one or more properties that are being rented out. Um, keep track of the rental rates in Beaumont for all type of properties. I do not think it is difficult to keep track of all this on the computer. This would help landlords to keep competitive rental rates in Beaumont, thereby attracting more people to the Beaumont economy. This would also create some employment for young students to do this work. We all have to be a bit more creative to make Beaumont more attractive. Um, to get started on this project, Beaumont can keep track of the residents, non-residents, and entities who pay taxes for more than one property and contact these owners and do some research and get some sense of their rental rates, et cetera, and emphasize to all owners to keep it very confidential. Um, and then he says, if you have any further questions, you can contact him. And he included his phone number, but we will share that privately with you, Mayor Stewart. I, I appreciate that. We shouldn't be putting somebody's private information out yeah. on the big wide yeah. internet. Um, but no, that's a great question. And actually, um, to be honest, we we do we do track it as far as, as commercial properties go, um, because we have seen a lot of empty spaces in our commercial properties. Um, but over the last year, we've also seen a lot of those spaces filling up, um, both in our downtown and our south end of Beaumont. Um, we've seen childcare spaces come in, we've seen restaurants, and we've seen other businesses open up. Um, but that being said, um, we still have a lot of empty space, um, but we have, and we've heard from our business community that part of that reason is, is very high rental rates. And so um, our uh, economic development team is in constant contact with the landlords, um, some of whom are out of Ontario and are, may not be very aware of the market conditions that we're in, um, to be able to work with them. Um, so where we can, we try to work with them, but I'll, I'll be honest, setting, setting rental rates is, is mostly out of our hands. Um, as for the residential side, I think that's a good idea. I'll take that idea back to our economic development team and uh, we'll see uh, how we can go from there. Um, the other thing that we were also starting on is we've got uh, uh, an affordable housing project that's, uh, that we're in a partnership with the uh, Fort McKay First Nation. Uh, and so Sorry, excuse me. Uh, affordable housing project in, that we're in partnership with the Fort McKay First Nation on. Uh, and so we're consulting them with our affordable housing strategy and we're continuing work on that. So we are we are trying to, to bring those rental rates in, into line and, and to track and see where it goes um, through various me mechanisms and means, but I'll definitely take it back to our uh, economic development team and, and see if we can do a little better track. Great. Uh, so we have another question that has come in for uh, Mayor Young, and they're asking, I'm wondering why the funding for the car charging station would not be fully funded by the feds. Uh, would this not be covered with carbon tax monies, uh, and that would leave money for other projects? That's a good question. And uh, like, actually, right now, we're exploring we, the um, I was actually talking to a couple of uh, companies that um, uh, set up 
um, these charging stations. And uh, uh, so what, what actually started this is uh, is we had a, uh, a car manufacturer that uh, um, asked us to set up because again, there's no charging station between here and uh, Red Deer. And so they, they asked us to set that up. So what's happening now is we've been exploring um, at first uh, first glance, uh, oh, you know, we were only to be able to get funding for about half of it. But uh, we've had a cu couple conversations today yet um, with uh, companies that are actually uh, doing this. Um, now that they know that the city of Leduc is interested in setting up these charging stations, um, there's uh, more interest. And uh, the, these companies actually contacted us. And uh, I think that there's going to be a good opportunity uh, for us to get them 100% funded. But uh, like anything, uh, this is fairly new territory. And uh, as we move into it, uh, we get more information. But uh, I'm really confident that we will be able to get 100% um, funding uh, on the charging station. Great. Thanks. Uh, so we have another one that's come in for MLA Rutherford. They say, um, Brad, with the recent announcement of $17.7 .7 million to Leduc County for the Spine Road, my understanding is that the province is not stepping up to the plate again with any dollars. So, want to comment on that? Sure. Um, you know, I guess for my my two years of experience, I'm not sure on the not stepping up again part, but I'll, I'll certainly look into it. Um, you know, there there is large amount of infrastructure dollars going into this riding, including you know, obviously we talked about the 65th Avenue uh, interchange, which is uh, you know a big part uh, of that trade corridor. Uh, and I and I know um, that the Ladue County uh, you know had a meeting with, uh, with Minister McIver on this uh, and, and you know, requested funds. Um, you know not all these things you know, work out every year. We we have a capital plan uh, that that's twenty seven or twenty point seven billion dollars. There's some substantial dollars going to uh, a lot of different projects. Uh, you know, I hope to pull as much of that into the riding as possible. Uh, but uh, I will admit I, I don't win them all. And, and I'll, I'll continue to try to make sure that, that, uh, that we're, we're getting the attention that we need uh, in advocating for these kinds of projects uh, as well as I go forward. Uh, and I'll do the best I can. And that, that's actually a good answer because it's really tough. Uh, you know, like the, the Spine Road announcement uh, that just happened on Monday is a great announcement for our region. Um, and it's, you know, it's going to really enhance our, our connection to the uh, Canamex uh, corridor and to the airport. And uh, you know, once we do get the final funding uh, for 65th Avenue, it'll join up with 65th Avenue. So, uh, but it's, it's really difficult. Uh, let me tell you firsthand, um, there are a lot of people asking for funding for projects. And uh, you know, uh, it's easy to sit back and say, oh geez, we, we should have got more funding from the provincial government, but uh, they have a lot of asks there. And uh, you know, like uh, sometimes I'm just glad I'm at the level that I'm at and, and not at the provincial level, uh, you know, because they have a lot of tough choices to make. And, uh, you know, we but one thing I know is that, uh, you know, we keep advocating and keep lobbying and uh, like sooner or later they get tired of saying no to you and uh, you'll get the funding. So uh, but it's that's that's the, the business we're in. Like it's, you know, I wish there was an easy way, um, you know, that we could just go and, and get the dollars we need but uh, it doesn't work that way. Next question. Yeah, uh, it's one that's come in for Mayor Stewart. They're asking what is happening with the Beaumont Innovation Park? Ah, that's a, a great project. Um, so where we're at right now is we've acquired the 160 acres uh, at the Southeast corner of 625 and 50th Street. That's where the, the, the Beaumont Innovation Park is going to be located. Um, right now, our city is putting together the area structure plan um, that will determine things like the placement of utilities and the staging of development uh, and other things like that um, to be able to uh, put the mechanisms in place to be able to attract businesses into the park. We're also continuing talks with an anchor tenant um, that has provided us with a uh, $1 million security for the project, uh, as well as we're speaking with other prospective tenants to, to move into that park. And uh, Aside from that, uh, we've commissioned a, a firm to market and recruit businesses for the park. And of course, we're continuing to engage with the province on, on uh, their economic development initiatives and goals, uh, which really do really well align with uh, what we're trying to do with the Bowman Innovation Park. So hopefully that answers your question. And I'll just jump in quickly. Uh, you know, 
you know, I, I've been doing my best to to support uh, Beaumont and Mayor Stewart on this. Um, there, it, it's an important project, and uh, I know it sounds vague when you say that it's just the anchor tenant. Um, it's a very exciting project, and, and, and we're making headway on it. Um, and, and, and the big thing for me, and I think I touched on this uh, earlier, uh, is that it's going to help keep people working locally in Beaumont, and it's going to attract a lot of people to Beaumont uh, for services as well. And, and to me, that that is going to be something that, uh, and I know Mayor Stewart sees this as well, is uh, it's good for your grocery stores, your gas stations, the restaurants, they get all, these local businesses uh, that, that need uh, you know, a, a higher volume of traffic of people moving in. Um, it, that's the important part for me. There, there's a lot of facets that this, a lot of boxes this checks, um, but really it, it helps you know, stimulate the local economy in Beaumont uh, at the same time. So um, hopefully they keep making headway on it. I, I know the, uh, the province is interested uh, and it, that's all the way up to the premier's office on that. Uh, we're we're making we're making uh, forward progress. We'll put it that way, uh, and, and hopefully we can make an announcement on it. Uh, you know, in short order. Next question. Yeah, uh, another one for MLA Rutherford. It says we've heard you talk about the 65th Avenue interchange in Leduc and two new schools for this area. Has the province supported any other projects over the last two years, and have you played any role in making those happen? Uh, yeah, and I guess if you're uh, if you've heard me talk about the 65th Avenue interchange, it's probably I, I say it far too often, along with with Mary Young. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things that, that comes up routinely uh, that we're excited about. But I, I mentioned a few of the other projects that that have come in that I I think are going to be really good for the community. That you know, funds around the Ken Nichols Center. Uh, are, are going to be uh, an important addition, um, you know, uh, things around the, the ABPA. And I know those are regulations and, and it doesn't really come across as, uh, as maybe that interesting. And I'll admit that as well when it comes to regulations, but it's going to lead to a lot of development and commercial uh, development as well. Uh, and, and it's going to be uh, really good for Leduc uh, to have that come forward. Um, but there's other uh, there, there's there's other not for profits that have received money uh, you know for the Leduc Legion when you brought it up it reminded me of, of OSI Can uh, which is a, a great group of a peer support organization uh, you know for first responders and veterans uh, and, and helping them get funding uh, for, for mental health supports uh, and, and so it, it's there's a, there's lots of different initiatives that that this office has taken on. Uh, and been successful at, at getting funds for, uh, including, you know, not-for-profits, charities, and, and, uh, and, and local infrastructure as well. Great, thank you. Um, this is one that was uh, sent in ahead of time. It's for Mayor Young, um, a suggestion, I think. They say, mm -hmm. consider BC-style property tax options where there are three levels. One, for those who did not live in the home, so rental property, uh, one for people who live in their house, and then one for seniors who live in their own home. So an interesting suggestion, and uh, we've had other uh, um, suggestions that you know we need to take a look at other options. This is one of those things, though, that we need to work with the provincial government as well, and uh, it's you know it's not so easy for municipalities just to institute their own uh, taxation and uh, you know we have to talk with the uh, provincial government as well to make sure that we're following all the uh, guidelines as, as well but it's definitely something we should look at um, i know that we're also uh, um, going to be looking at ways that uh, like uh, not just uh, rental but some of the properties that have been abandoned and uh, and uh, haven't been developed on so i know that we're going to be looking at ways that we can uh, start to deal with those as well and it, it, this is an ongoing problem. And the way we calculate and assess municipal taxes, it's fundamentally broken and nobody understands it. And every year at this time, um, people come out of the woodwork and complain. Uh, and so I, I agree with Bob and, and this is Brad's fair warning that this has hit my radar. Uh, there has to be a better way uh, to do municipal property taxes. And so uh, coming up over the next couple of years, we're definitely going to have a have a hard look and a hard chat about uh, simplifying the system and making it more fair as uh, as BC has tried to do, but I'm not sure they've been overly successful. But so here we go. I, I'm happy to sit down with both of you anytime. Or <laughs> and actually, that's true. That's one of the things I, I will give credit to Emily Rutherford is that uh, 
Um, he hears from uh, me and John way more than he probably wants to. So, but you know what? He's always uh, always available, and that, that's one of the things that we really appreciate um, in in this region is that um, you know the provincial politicians are very accessible, especially MLA Rutherford, and uh, you know it's. Uh, we look at this as we're all in this in the same business and you know the better we work together uh, the better it is for everybody so i agree he hasn't blocked my calls yet so we're good for a while yet we beat down one box <laughs> that's not me <laughs> go ahead natalie okay so another one that came in for you mayor young it asks when is the city of Leduc rolling out the property assessed clean energy program? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Kara Chomlack would be the person to contact that. I believe it's rolling out fairly soon. And so in that program, what that, uh, what that will allow is that will allow property owners to um, do energy uh, conservative uh, projects. Um, they can put solar panels, they can replace water heaters, they can replace windows. And what that does is it allows um, the property owner then to put that on their taxes. And uh, so it's a great way of uh, making those improvements without having to uh, cost uh, or, or, or kill property owners with the direct cost. So, and it gets just put on the uh, property taxes uh, going forward. So, um, but again, look at our website. And uh, uh, if you check out Kira Chomlak, um, she is definitely the person to contact about that. And, and it should also be noted that, that Beaumont is also looking at this program uh, for our community. Uh, we're in the middle of updating our environmental master plan. Uh, yeah. And as part of that process, we're looking at how we can implement the PACE program uh, within our community as well. So uh, look forward to, for Beaumont residents, look forward to seeing more information on that as we uh, roll out the public engagement in through the summer and into the fall. And if, if anybody, uh, actually, probably the easiest way is uh, send me an email. Uh, it's uh, mayor at leduc.ca. Send me an email if you want information about that, and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, somebody contacts you. Great. Uh, so we have another one that's come in for both uh, mayors, Young and Stewart. Uh, they say both cities issued their own mask mandates before it was provincially required. What evidence did you base that decision on and how are you evaluating what worked and what did not? You want me to take a go? Go ahead, John, you can take the first crack at it. Okay, so I know that back in, in August when we when Beaumont Council looked at this, um, there was a couple things going on. One, as much as the province hadn't um, put, uh, put a mask mandate in place, they were strongly recommending the use of. Um, and so we took that information and we went and we consulted our local business community. Um, and many of those individuals were concerned that if uh, measures weren't taken, uh, the cases could rise and they would have and they would have to close their businesses again. And we really want to we're really trying hard to avoid that. Um, so our administration took took that information, reviewed all the medical information that was available at the time, including from the CDC in the United States. Uh, and council made the decision based on the best information available we had at the time. Yeah. Um, it should be noted that uh, when the province brought in their provincial mandate, uh, Beaumont allowed uh, our mask bylaw to expire in favor of, in favor of theirs. So um, once again, all I can say is we're following them and, and it's the best guidance we can. So um, yeah. The province left it up to municipalities in that August, September area if, if we wanted to do it or not. So our council, based on the information at hand, uh, took the plunge in order to protect our businesses. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with John. The, we were, I was really, and I think our council was really hoping that we would never ever have to uh, have a mass bylaw. But unfortunately, the infection rate uh, with COVID-19, um, like we, in a very short time, we went from uh, four people in Leduc um, to uh, nearly 300 people in Leduc. And uh, so, uh, you know, we had to uh, put a, a bylaw in effect. And it wasn't long after our bylaw was in that the province instituted a uh, province-wide uh, bylaw as well. Uh, again, I wish somebody would have lent us their pandemic playbook and, uh, you know, we could have uh, all been on the same page with this. Um, you know, like I say, in hindsight, it's really easy to say, oh, um, we should have done things different. But uh, in real time, uh, you know, we're just trying to do what we thought was best and, and keeping our citizens safe. So, 
you know, if, if people want to hold us to task for that, so be it. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud of what our council did during the pandemic. And uh, I think that we reacted in a very um, mature and uh, professional way. So again, I, if I had my choice, we would never ever have had a pandemic, but I didn't have a choice in that. So I, uh, like I say, you know, we did the best we could. Go ahead, Natalie. So uh, another one that we have here for Emily Rutherford, they say the city of Leduc has started a campaign to raise awareness about the restrictions that AVPA is putting on development in the city. What is being done provincially to change the AVPA and do you support these changes? Um, you know, it's a good question because I actually, in, from that campaign, Bob, uh, the, the calls have increased <laughs> to my <laughs> office. Yeah, I want to be, I want to be clear because I, I just want to make sure that people know that the, the issue with the Airport Vicinity Protection Act and the regulations is, is what the province has put in. Uh, and, and, and the stakeholders, including the Edmonton International Airport, have been very open to discussions uh, and conversations conversations around, around potential changes uh, and what we can do to, to really update those regulations. So a, a lot of the stakeholders have, have been uh, very willing to, to come to the table and have that conversation. Um, you know, if, if it's a resident's frustration with it, then, then that should be pointed at us uh, and those regulations are provincial. So there's, uh, we put forward about five or six uh, recommendations um, and, and I, I think uh, we're going to get about five. I think it's five of them. Bob, you can correct me. Um, but the, the big things for me was just making sure that, you know, if somebody wanted to, to build an infill, uh, you know, tear down their house, uh, build two, uh, you now, if there's changes, then you won't need the minister's uh, permission to do that because currently you do. Uh, the, the contours, um, it's a lot to explain without maybe some visual aid, but there's a series of contours running off the runways that prohibit things that can be done in each successive contour. And we're, we're going to be changing some of that to match Calgary, which is really going to open up things, especially for the downtown business uh, area, where a, a, a denser population, it's currently lim limited at 650, a denser population is going to help the local businesses there. And, and, I, and I think we can, we can move forward with this and balance the need of the 24 seven aspect of the airport, which is crucial. Everybody agreed to protect that. And, uh, and I think we, we've made some very good headway and, and I look forward to all of the development that this will unlock uh, and, and the job creation that comes with that. So I don't know, uh, Bob, if you got anything you wanna add on that. Uh, no, I, I think you've explained it very well. Uh, you know, the, what people don't understand is that, um, and I, I think Calgary had an easier time with getting changes to their AVPA, because again, they're the only ones that um, are affected by AVPA in the Calgary region. Uh, but in our region, um, the city of Leduc, 80% of the city of Leduc is affected by AVPA uh, legislation. Uh, but we have partners uh, that are to a much lesser extent affected and AVPA really doesn't have uh, any effect on their development. Um, you know, in the city of Leduc, because 80% of our community is covered by uh, those uh, noise exposure forecasting contours, um, it's, it's been really, really um, devastating to some of the things that uh, we can do. And so um, I'm really happy uh, Emily Rutherford has worked with us and our partners. Um, EIA has been great through this. Again, uh, the city of Leduc, we know how important the 24-7 uh, operation of the airport is. And, you know, we just wish that the legislation would have been keep the airport open all the time, uh, rather than uh, restricting some of the land use that we can do in the city of Leduc. And so uh, the changes that uh, we, we've been working really closely with EIA and with our partners, and I think we're very close to having a solution. And so uh, I'm looking forward uh, that in the near future, we'll be announcing um, when, once the minister gets a chance to take a look at uh, uh, some of the things that we agree on with uh, our partners and with EIA. Uh, I think that you're gonna see some uh, changes to the legislation that will make it uh, a win-win proposition for all our, of the uh, people affected by AVPA in this region. So again, uh, looking forward to that announcement as well. And I just want to just reiterate that, you know, taking these kinds of things on, and, and I know this is probably not a topic on 99% of people's minds, um, but when, when we put the effort into these things, we're thinking of the overalls, the macro level picture of this, like, 
it, it's going to be important that there's more commercial development. Uh, there's going to be higher density in a downtown area. There's going to be more residences uh, on uh, on the east side of Leduc, so it's not sprawling out. All of these things, you know, tie together, uh, you know, for for a city to help a city grow, uh, but also to create jobs and support the economy. So uh, th there is a reason we take these things on, even though you uh, have likely have never heard of uh, this particular set of regulations. Next question. Yeah, another one for Mayor Stewart. They say, is the proposed Beaumont industrial area really a good plan right now? I see Nisku is a ghost town right now and the vacancy rate is high. This is good agricultural land. If there's one thing the pand pandemic has enlightened, up, enlightened us, it is to be more self-sufficient. Should we not be trying to keep some land for growing our food? Um, the short answer to that question is, is yes, it's a good plan. Um, but you bring up some really interesting uh, topics and, and some of that we're, we're already tackling at the NRB level. Um, and specifically in relation to good agricultural land, we're currently doing the Regional Agricultural Master Plan Program or RAM, um, which is looking at ways that we can keep those good lands, good agricultural lands producing food um, for as long as possible. We're also looking at ways that we can take food that's growing here, uh, value add to it, uh, and then ship finished products versus shipping the raw goods, which is what Alberta is really good at. We ship a lot of raw goods to a lot of places so that people can make the bread, the bread, the cheese, and whatever else comes along. Um, and so we're looking at that. Um, the Bowman Innovation Park is not really meant to compete with NISQ. I, I know NISQ's rates are really, really, their vacancy rates are high, but they're, they're a very heavy industrial use oriented um, business park. Um, that's not going to be the Bowman Innovation Park. Um, we're not going to compete with them. We're not going to, we're not going after the same businesses. So there is room in the ecosystem for, for both of us to exist. The Bowman Innovation Park, for all the reasons that we've stated before, and, and uh, Emily Rutherford did a very eloquent job of uh, outlining how the spinoffs would help our local businesses and things like that, uh, are really important to Beaumont's local economy and to uh, keeping our tax rates lower and providing those uh, common uh, services to our community. And so um, yes, the Beaumont Innovation Park is, is a good plan, um, but we do have to do look at all the, the factors involved. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with John, uh, you know, like the, we have to diversify, like, you know, uh, traditionally, uh, the Leduc Business Park in Nisku has been oil and gas uh, focused, and I think that um, we need to diversify our economy, and I, I you know, I'm really optimistic that this last quarter that we're going to start, you know, now that we're coming out of the pandemic and we're open for business for this summer, uh, that we're going to start to see us going into a mini boom. And I, I predict that uh, the next two years are going to be really good. And I think that, you know, that while we've had some challenges during the pandemic and with the uh, um, prices of oil and gas, uh, it's created some challenges for us. Uh, that we are going to go into a mini boom. And I think that uh, Beaumont is being proactive and uh, it, it's going to uh, uh, pay off uh, in the long run for uh, uh, the region. And like with them in the global now, um, they, are, uh, they are basically marketing our region um, nationally and internationally. And so uh, the more uh, opportunities that you have to invest in this region, um, it means that we're going to get more investment. So um, yeah, it is. Uh, I, I know that uh, when you take a look at some of the uh, vacancy rates in our business parks right now, uh, that you know people say, "Well, you know, does it make sense?" Um, to me, it does because this is potential investment for the future. I also hope uh, when, when we can talk more openly about the anchor tenant, uh, that, that the overall vision of it uh, will become more apparent uh, as well. Uh, and, and that will sort of frame what uh, Beaumont is trying to achieve with it uh, as well. And, and I think some of the points that they've made, uh, both mirrors here on, on that, will will become clear um, uh, going forward. So I just thought I'd add that in. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Uh, so this one is directed to MLA Rutherford, and they're asking, um, wondering if MLA Rutherford. Uh, or the mayors have any plans they can share regarding efforts to advocate uh, and support the Indigenous community um, or about engaging in any of the 94 calls to action by the TRC within their own circles of influence? Um, 
No, the, the first answer I, I guess I gave, I think might, maybe I covered some of that as well um, on some of the things that I, that I think can be done and that the province is doing as well. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at, at that. Uh, and if there, if there's a need for, um, you know, more of a conversation surrounding it, happy to have that uh, as well. But, you know, just the Indigenous Opportunities, the Corporation Act, um, uh, the Moose Lake Access Management Plan was one of them. Uh, the Alberta Joint Working Group um, uh, around uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women, uh, have, waiving the fees for um, Indigenous people to reclaim uh, their, their names from uh, when they were changed with residential schools. Uh, and then the recent $8 million fund uh, that was, that was uh, provided, I think they're $150,000 grants uh, to, to research and look for all these aerial sites as well. <clears throat> um, and, it, and within the, the, the the calls for action. Uh, there, there's you know several that jump out to me that I that I think uh, you know are, are pertinent um, uh, to be to be looked at. Uh, you know some of them are on the federal side and the provincial side, and, and the one I touched on was uh, really regarding um, looking at root causes of problems uh, and, and making sure that those that those are being uh, addressed. And I and I think that that's something that. Um, and I, I just have to research that one more, whether or not it's, it's a federal issue with what the courts are allowed to do, uh, or if it comes from the provincial side uh, as well. Um, but it is something that I, I think we need to strive for uh, more, more broadly. Um, and, and it would encompass a lot of different things uh, as well. And when we're looking at um, you know, generational trauma, uh, mental health issues, addiction issues, things that have stemmed from uh, you know, residential schools and, and all of the, the, the different things that that have, uh, that have come from that uh, within the Indigenous community. Um, so uh, turn it over to either, either Mayor, uh, if you want to jump in there. Yeah, and what, like I said before, my previous answer to, to a similar question, um, the City of Beaumont is really focused on, on, on building those relationships um, with the Indigenous people um, that, that are, were from in, in and around Beaumont. Um, because it's really important that we step forward towards those truth and reconciliation goals and, and calls to action um, with them uh, and not be unilateral in how we try to implement them. And so as we continue to have those conversations and, and build those relationships and, tr and, and trust between us, we can, we, can start to, we can start to move forward. And if that's uh, if bringing uh, Emily Rutherford to the table is something that we need to do, we're prepared to do that. And if it's a provincial a mandate that cannot be totally done by the municipality or if we can do it regionally with Mary Young as well. Um, we're more than happy to have those conversations and move forward. But the biggest thing, the biggest key step right now is building those relationships um, so that we can have those meaningful conversations. Uh, and I, I agree with Mayor Stewart and uh, Emily Rutherford. I think one of the biggest uh, first steps in, in uh, moving forward with this is being made aware of the, of the problem. And I, I think that um, everybody is aware that, uh, you know, there's, there's steps we have to do. Just like uh, the city of Leduc uh, did with our environmental, um, you know, um, we're, we're going to take baby steps. And so um, I believe that if we haven't already hired, that we, that we are hiring somebody that is going to uh, work with us uh, to help develop a, a Indigenous strategy moving forward. And uh, we've had um, different uh, um, Indigenous uh, uh, companies reach out to us to take a look at um, affordable housing projects. Um, you know, um, like I say, it's more important that we get this right than we get it done fast. And, uh, you know, it's, it's baby steps and, and, you know, I wish that we could uh, um, give you all the answers uh, right away. Um, we can't. Um, this is something that's just been put on our radar. And, uh, but we are um, moving to uh, make sure that um, we can do everything that we can. And I, I know just like uh, Mayor Stewart said, um, we're looking at uh, building relationships. Uh, I, I know that we've met a few times now with uh, Chief Warren from Enoch. Cree Nation, and uh, you know, I look forward to uh, building bridges and uh, seeing what we can do. Uh, we've done a, a great job with the uh, 13 municipalities in the region, and I think that we can do a better job now uh, reaching out to some of the um, uh, Indigenous nations in the region as well. Next question, Natalie. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're nearing the end here, but we do have one more question for Mayor Stewart asking, how is the city of Beaumont helping businesses who are struggling due to COVID restrictions? Well, we've done actually a, a fair bit. 
Um, we supported businesses throughout the pandemic in a number of ways. Um, we actually went out and provided the physical distancing floor markers and connected business owners with resources that they might need to be able to comply with the COVID restrictions. Um, and we helped them with some continuity and some resiliency planning um, to help them get through it. Uh, we also partnered with our chamber for the Open in Beaumont campaign, uh, encouraging residents to shop local. Uh, and we also set up a, a grant for businesses requiring accounting or bookkeeping assistance to apply for both the provincial and the federal assistance because we, we got told that sometimes those uh, regulations weren't uh, necessarily all that easy to, to navigate and follow. Um, and then just yesterday, of course, we, we kicked off our participation in the Discover the Duke Region Tourism Campaign to, be, to bring more people to Beaumont um, as the province starts to reopen. Uh, and as always, we are open to suggestion. If uh, there's something that we can be doing that we're not, um, please drop us a line and let us know. Um, we're more than happy to look at it. Yeah. And, and we've been working as a region. So I, like, I, you know, I'm glad that uh, John mentioned some of those things. So like the COVID uh, assistance grant. So what we did is um, we partnered with uh, companies so that uh, they would get financial assistance or, or accounting assistance to help them reach out for the provincial and federal grants. Um, you know, we did that with uh, Beaumont. We did that with uh, Wetaskiwin. Um, and in Leduc. So, you know, we're working together as a region to do that. Uh, we've also um, set up now a Get Digital uh, program. We're partnering with the University of Alberta. And again, th uh, this will help um, companies um, with their e-commerce and their e-presence. E um, with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the first grant, we had over a hundred companies that uh, took advantage of the uh, assistance for that. Um, with our Get Digital program now, we've already had 50 uh, companies, uh, small businesses uh, that have uh, been accepted for that, and uh, we're accepting up to 100. And uh, again, I believe, uh, you know, this is a program we're looking at um, partnering with uh, Beaumont, uh, partnering with Wetaskiwin, I think even um, the County of Wetaskiwin, the Jedi, uh, we're looking at partnering with them. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that, uh, you know, as a mayor, as a new mayor, um, I wasn't very focused on uh, small business, school teacher, uh, and, uh, but what the pandemic has really shown me is how important small businesses are and how much uh, uh, support they needed through this. And so uh, we have partnered with our Downtown Business Association and with the, uh, with the Leduc Nisku Wetaskiwin Chamber, and we meet weekly now. Uh, we're setting up a uh, entrepreneur program where we're going to uh, help mentor um, small home businesses and new businesses. Um, again, we'll be sharing um, these uh, information with uh, Beaumont and with Tasquin as well. And, uh, you know, we think that uh, that's one, one benefit of the pandemic. There's been a lot of, uh, of terrible things from it, but I think that this has been one of the uh, benefits of the pandemic is that um, our partnerships uh, within the region and our partnerships with our small businesses have uh, really uh, improved. And I think that uh, going forward that our community is going to be stronger for it. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of terrible things from this pandemic, but there's also been some uh, lessons that are going to uh, benefit us in the future as well. So, Natalie, I see we're uh, at our, our time. So is that it for the evening? I think we do have one last question for Mayor Stewart, and then oh, that get it for John. I'm the popular one. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you uh, think. <laughs> <laughs> so they're asking, um, when will Beaumont build a performing arts center? Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, actually, we are. Uh, this has one of been one of council's priorities over the last last couple of years, um, we, and we've taken some action to actually move that project forward. We uh, we commissioned a couple of feasibility studies that identified various options um, for the city as to where we could put it, where how it could be funded, different sizes, things like that. Um, and uh, just recently, we've been paneled a, a steering committee. <laughs> uh, we were trying to assemble a group of experts to be able to take all that information uh, and distill it down and uh, bring back a report and recommendation to council. Oh, I'd like it to be budget 2022, but it's not possible. Um, there's just too much work to do. So looking at um, perhaps looking at something uh, to go forward in, in 2023. Um, but that's where we're at now. We've empowered a group of experts to have a look at all of our options and, and move this project forward. So 
Uh, looking forward to seeing their report next year and, uh, and and moving forward on that project. And Brad, we're, we're going to be coming for a grant, so Gary. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the wonderful things about municipal uh, <laughs> politics is that, you know, just when you get something done and if you're all right, look what we've accomplished, there's another thing that pops up on the list. So um, we're never, ever finished. And we shouldn't be because, like, again, our communities are never finished growing. Nope, keeps me busy. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, I'd like to thank uh, Brad and John for joining me tonight and uh, Natalie and Alice. And, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, I think in the, you know, going forward, we'll probably do this uh, a few more times because, again, uh, you know, it's, uh, we've had some tough questions tonight, but uh, I mean, that's what we're here for. And, you know, like the, I think the more that we're made aware of problems and concerns in our community, the better we are equipped to deal with those. So I appreciate, um, you know, again, John and Brad, I appreciate you uh, putting yourselves out like this because uh, we've had some tough questions tonight. And, uh, you know, for anybody that thinks this is an easy uh, job to take, uh, you know, just sit in a few of these to find out what it's really like. So, but again, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. And uh, I think it's been a really uh, good uh, information session. Yeah, I, I appreciate yeah. the opportunity to take part. And uh, uh, it's been fun sharing, sharing the floor with you, gentlemen. And yeah, I hope that we should do this more often. It, it's good. And uh, I'll leave it to Brad to wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, you know, to both you and Natalie as well for, uh, uh, for uh, getting, getting us the questions. And I appreciate that and Mary Young uh, and uh, both Mayor Stewart for, for participating. And, and I hope that in the, in the future, when we do this again, obviously we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be in person. It could be yes. more of a discussion uh, as well with, with folks. Um, it, it, I've always found it helpful to be able to go back and forth a little bit uh, just to learn from people. Uh, yeah. Well, we did the best we could with what we had here, uh, and, and I think it was informative, uh, but I'm looking forward to doing it in person. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, open for summer. So I think that's everything. So thank you, Natalie, Alice. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, good night. Good night.